Good morning, everyone. Well, here we are on the last day of 2016. What a good day it is. Is it a good day? To me, it is. I had a great 2016. I, uh, last night I couldn't sleep, it was too hot. I rolled around and rolled. I thought, I'll think of all the good things that happened to me during this year. And there were lots. I could think of a lot of good things that God has done for me. When I prepared the sermon, I thought, what can I say that is fitting for this time of year? What will suit? And uh, turn in your Bibles with me to Luke 15. I just want to read, maybe I should say a prayer before I read. <laughs> Let's just close our eyes and then I'll say a prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this wonderful privilege of ending this year in your name. Father, as we gather here, worshipping you. Father, bless the words that I speak. May they bring a message to someone. Bless our ears that may, we may hear your voice, that it may help us in what lies ahead. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, Luke 15. And I just want to read the first sentence of two verses. Verse 18. This is the prodigal son. And he's in the pigsty. Um, and the first sentence says, I will arise and go to my father. And then the first sentence of verse 20 is, and he arose. Now, there is a saying that says, talk is cheap, but money buys the whiskey. Ever heard that one? Talk is cheap, but money buys the whiskey. Can you think of any other sayings like that? Come on. Actions speak louder than words. The proof of the pudding is in the eating. Yes. Another one? Anybody? In the military they used to say, you can talk the talk, but can you walk the walk? Some things are easier said than done. It's easy to flap your mouth, but to do what you are saying is a different question, isn't it? New Year's resolutions is becoming a bit of a joke, isn't it? <laughs> Why? Maybe because nobody keeps it, yes. Is that the pattern of your life, the trend of your life, taking New Year's decisions and never keep them? Think of the situation of this son. He insulted his father. Never made contact with him whatsoever again after that. His older brother was not really his best friend. All the community and friends of the family that looked up to that family now is gossiping in the town because the family was embarrassed. And you, the cause of that embarrassment, now say, I will get up and go to my father. I'm sure he must have thought to himself, 
I wonder how my father will receive me. How on earth will I be able to look everyone in the eye again? Um, without a doubt, he thought to himself, there will be some consequences. It puts that decision a little bit in a different perspective for me. It wasn't a small decision, I think. Maybe the hunger helped him a little bit, but I think it took a lot of courage for him to stand up and take that first step back home. Some people don't make decisions easy. Uh, have you met people like that? Are you one of them? You know, they decide on something and then they think about it and they change their mind and they uh, think again and they take the decision again. And um, Some people just like to sit on the fence. Uh, for some reason, they think there is benefit in that. They like to uh, have a foot on each side. Do you have an opinion? You know, Rob once said to me there in that foyer, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. What does that mean? It means that there is a lot of people that, um, that will wake up in hell. <laughs> Always wanted to take a different course of action, but never did. And somehow they ended up where they didn't really want it to be. What is it about our good intentions that have to change? What did God give us to help us make a choice when we have to make a choice? Holy Spirit. We call it today our will or the power of choice. Are you decisive? Can you make up your mind? Um, Steps to Christ, page 48 and 49, says, and I paraphrase this now big time, but it says something like, the desire to do right is good as far as it goes. But if it stops there, it amounts to nothing. There was a time in my life when I didn't like to read Steps to Christ. As a matter of fact, it annoyed me tremendously. People quoted out of Steps to Christ and it made me shiver. I, I didn't like that. Because I've tried in my life many times and made decisions and then I mess it up. Until one day I listened to a sermon of Pastor Victor Gill. I don't know if you've heard of him. He's an old fella and he said it as it is. And he said, if you take a decision and you use your will, give your will back to God. He will change it because he, it is him that wants to will in us. He will give it back to you and then you follow through with it. And it, in my mind, it, it helped me to get over that feeling of steps to Christ. 
the prodigal son desired to go home. But he had to do more than desire and wish. Had he not made the decision and got up and take the first step, he may as well perished between the pigs. Always wanted to be with his father, desiring to be at his father. Are you like that when it comes to Christianity? Are you saying, I have to read my Bible more? Or I have to do this, or I have to do that? What are the chances that you actually do it? What will it take for us to act on our decisions? Some kind of a disaster? Or a tragedy? Tragedy. How many times have I promised myself in my life that I want to memorize scripture? And then I get busy with this, and I get busy with that, and I come home in the evenings, and I'm tired. Does God have to allow an accident to happen in my life so that I may end up in hospital, to have time to memorize scripture. No. God hasn't, doesn't have to do that. If you want to do something, make a decision and do it. Indecisiveness brings stress. It brings guilt. It brings disease, it brings unhappiness, and it brings a lot more questions and decisions. Decisiveness brings peace. Have you ever found it when you make the decision? It's over. First Kings 18. First Kings 18, and that is the very well-known story of Elijah. Ahab and Jezebel. And I'm just thinking now in my mind, here is God talking to Elijah, saying, Elijah, these guys are worshipping the rain god. Do you think that if I stop the rain for a while, we will get their attention? And so here is Elijah, walked to the palace, passed the guards, got into Ahab's face. There will be no rain for three and a half years. Turned around and walked out. By the time everybody got to their senses, Elijah is gone. <laughs> Just a side note, when God hides something, you'll never find it. So, three and a half years without rain. The crops were dying. I think we can relate to that a little bit today. It hasn't rained for a while. The grass is dead. It's dust everywhere. The soil is cracked. The cattle, those that are still alive, is just skin and bone staggering through the paddocks. The crows and the vultures is having a great time eating the dead animals? Do you think God got their attention? He sure did. Elijah went back to the palace. Tell Ahab, get your priests and everybody else will meet up on the mountain. Let's read 1 Kings 18 verse 21. And here, Elijah has put his finger right on the problem. Verse 21, And Elijah came to all the people and said, How long will you falter between two opinions?
What did they answer him? The text said, not a word. Why did they answer him, not a word? Because they were between a rock and a hard place. They were Israelites. They knew what was right. They knew that God was giving the rain. But here they had Jezebel and her priest. And if they chose God, they've got them on their backs. If they chose Baal, they've got Elijah here. They were not decisive enough. In the Bible, there are three Elijahs. That one, John the Baptist, and then Jesus Christ. Matthew 11.14 refers to Jesus as Elijah. All three of these Elijahs was bringing people to a point where they have to make up their minds. The problem with this church in which you are sitting today is that we are hovering between two opinions. We are lukewarm. We are indecisive. We have one foot in the church because we don't want to get lost. But we've got one foot in the world because we don't want to miss out on anything. And we got complacent and we are quite happy where we are. Has the devil invented enough toys to keep us busy? And that counts from the youngest to grandma. Some of us are so overworked, stressed of our feet that we get home at night and we fall on the couch. Others are bored and indulge with all kind of entertainment. If you don't take the time to make a decision on how you are going to grow closer to Christ, let me tell you something. The devil has enough for you to do that you will never have time to worship God if you are not determined and make a decision and take the first step. What makes you so sure that you will have another choice? Where will you end up if today's decision was your last decision? It is not your decision whether you will see the sun rise again tomorrow morning. In your mind, you may think, I've got plenty of time. My life is ahead of me. And you may be right. But the future doesn't lie in your choice of what uni I'm going to, what job I'm going to do, where, where I'm going to work. Your whole life may pivot on just one decision. It's scary, isn't it? Today's decision may mean life or death to you. The Bible says, I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. That is a statement. It's not a question. The question is, will you? Oh, I can stop smoking anytime I want. Have you heard people say that? It's true. There are millions of people that stopped smoking before you. Or whatever you have to stop. And maybe you can too. But that is not the question. The question is, will you? A great Adventist saying is, I always wanted to be a missionary. <laughs> really? So why are you not one? The question is not can you. The question is will you. Make a decision. 
and be that missionary if you want to. You don't really want to be a missionary if you don't make the decision. Lorich once said to me, <laughs> he read or heard something and he said, Dad, have you heard about that? It is so nice. It would be so good to do that. And I said, well, why don't you do it? And he turned around, <laughs> looked to me as if I'm stupid, and he said, Dad, that's just one of those things that you think about. You don't really do that. <laughs> Today, it is hard to get someone to make a decision. When we were younger, before the days of cell phones, when you said to someone, I'll meet you at 3 o'clock in front of the post office, you better be there. But now you just text him. I lost my shoe. Can't make it. <laughs> if you don't deliberately make a choice, and give your life to God every morning. The devil make sure, will make sure that you are so sad or so happy, so occupied or so busy or so whatever, that you are so wrapped up in your own little world that you will never do it. A missionary is a missionary right where the missionary is. And if you are not one, it is because you never really wanted to be one. Or you are not decisive enough to make that choice. If you sin, is it because the devil forced you or made you sin? No. It's his job to tempt you. And he is really, really good at it. But if you sin, it is because you chose to. If you do well, is it because God forced you? No, God gave you his grace. God gave you his word. God gave you the power. Jesus went to the cross. All we need not to sin is available to us. It is even unreasonable to sin. Because the Bible says we are not tempted above which we are able to. And with every temptation, the way of escape. We have everything we need not to sin. Then why do we sin? Because we decide to sin. It is that simple. Joel 13, no, Joel 3. Joel doesn't have 13 chapters. Joel 3, verse 13 and 14. Joel is one of those small little books that you can never find. Uh, so, Joel 3, let's read verse 13 and 14. Now, Joel, the whole book of Joel... It's about getting ready for the last days. It's just before Amos. It says, Put in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Come, go down, for the winepress is full. The vats overflow, for their wickedness is great. Verse 14, multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. In the last days, every one of us are being called on to make a decision. Revelation 13 is about the devil that says, I want to be worshipped. Revelation 14 is, no, 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 God says, 
I'm the one that needs to be worshipped. If you worship the devil, there will be consequences. So, just like the first Elijah, Christ is calling us to make up our minds. The text says, Jesus stands at the door and knocks. If you make the decision to open it up, if the devil is God, then make up your mind and serve him. But remember, we know that the enemy only comes to steal and to kill. If God is worth worshipping, then how long are you sitting on two decisions? There are a lot of people that doesn't know how to make a decision. Why? Because they doesn't make decisions. It's rusted. The mechanism doesn't work anymore. It doesn't suit us today to make a decision. We'll see how we feel. What are we going to do in the last days if they line the pastor and his family up against the wall and say, make your choice. Is it Saturday or Sunday? And if you say it's Saturday, you know they're going to shoot them. Or if there's problems in the church. And we are warned, there will be problems in the church. If you want to go left or right, are you going to look at the pastor or the person that you always look up to? Or are you going to decide for yourself, am I going left or am I going right? God wants us to study the Bible for ourselves and make up our own minds. If I cannot make a decision today, What makes you think it will be easier to take that same decision tomorrow? If I cannot decide today to put Christ first in my life and study the Bible or whatever you have to do, what makes you think there will be a tomorrow in which you can make that choice? Or even worse, what makes you think that a month from now you even may want to make that decision. Three quotes, and then we're done. Volume 4 of Testimonies, 454, paragraph 1. It says, Without decision, an individual is fickle, unstable as water, and can never be truly successful. End of quote. Do you want to be successful? Be decisive. Make a decision. But I don't want to make a mistake, you say. What if I take, make the wrong decision and, uh, and, uh, and whatever your excuse is? Not making a decision is a mistake. God doesn't care if you make a mistake. But he does care if you don't know how to make a choice. Everything in life pivots on your choice. Who of you have been in school? So I assume we all started in grade one with mathematical problems, learning to add and subtract. Have you ever had all those problems correct? No. Does it matter today if you made a lot of mistakes then? No, it doesn't matter two hoots. God doesn't care if you make a mistake. We are all in the school of life. Alan White says somewhere, and I couldn't find the quote, but she says that God allowed her and her husband to make mistakes. What? The prophet making mistakes? Why? It was good for her, and it was good for her husband to make... They learned something out of their mistakes. Do you learn something out of your mistakes? So don't be indecisive. That is a mistake. Fourth volume of Testimonies, page 344. Also the first paragraph, it says, Indecision soon becomes decision 
in the wrong direction. End of quote. To be indecisive is a decision, and it's the wrong decision. Is it okay to make a wrong decision? Well, not on purpose. Do you make mistakes on purpose? All the time we do. <laughs> we choose to eat the wrong food on purpose. And there's many other things like that. But this is not what he talks about. This is a person who honestly intends to do the right thing. And he makes a mistake because he takes a decision. Makes a decision. And God says it is better than to always ponder on two decisions. Be decisive. Read your Bible. Notice what God wants you to do. Give your will to God. And then make the decision and take the first step. When the third quote, third testament is 497, paragraph 3. It says, long delays tire the angels. I never thought I can tire the angels. Long delays tire the angels. It is even more excusable to make the wrong decision sometimes than to be continuously in a wavering position. End of quote. When does God give us the strength to make a decision? Is it before the decision or after the decision? Well, it is true that Jesus went to the cross, the enemy is already defeated, and all the power of the universe is available to us. But it is after the decision. Jesus walked into Gethsemane for the last severe struggle between him and Satan. And Mark 14 verse 34 says, Jesus was exceedingly sorrowful even unto death. Jesus went into Gethsemane and all the sins of the world was being placed on his shoulders. And it is something, or it was something, that he has never experienced before. And the text said that it affected him so much, even unto death. He would have died in Gethsemane if help wasn't given to him. When was help given him? Three times he pleaded with his father saying, Father, is there no other way? You can change it if you want. And his argument against his father was, in verse 36, nothing is impossible unto you. And what a powerful argument is that? Because it's true. God could have changed it. But God said no. God says, no, I can't do that and save the world at the same time. You have to go through with this. So, Jesus made the decision. Not my will, but your will be done. Jesus made the decision in the favor of God and decided to trust his Father. To trust his father even though it looked as bleak as he did. And then the power came. And that is how it works. How many times in my life have I pleaded for strength? I know I'm being tempted and I struggle and I say, God, please help me. But I mess up. The power never comes. I now realize that the power never comes because it's when I make the decision to trust in God and to do what He says 
and leave the consequences to him that the power comes. So don't just sit there today praying for power to overcome. You will never overcome just praying about it. You have to make a decision. And you have to give that to God. That is when the power comes. Decide for God. The power is there. You can trust it. God is there. He will never leave you nor forsake you. You can trust that. Once you have decided, give your decision to God. Give your will to God. He will strengthen it and give it back to you. Decide today and act on it. Here we are at the end of 2016. I don't know what is going on in your mind. I don't know what you are struggling with. I don't have to know. I've got my own. But you know. And God knows. Make a decision. Don't sit on the fence. Talk to God. And decide that you will follow him whatever may come. That is when peace and power comes. In Jesus' name, amen. Heavenly Father, thank you for all the good things that I can remember of 2016. Thank you for the times when I could feel, sense your presence in my life around me. Thank you that you've been with me in the difficult ones. Father, give me the courage and the trust in you to make good decisions today and tomorrow, every day that lies ahead. Be with every one of us. Father, we are going home you are coming back. Father, help me to make decisions that can take me home. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.